The Heightened Mind, 4. Damatalks. A John Lee Damadero. Dama for Everyone. October 5, 1960. Now I'm going to remind you of some of the Buddha's teachings as a way of encouraging you to be intent on practicing correctly in line with the Buddha's bidding. These teachings are called Dhamma. The Dhamma is an ornament for the mind. It's also a means for developing the faculties of the mind. The teachings I'm about to discuss come in the Ovdapamakha, the Pamakha exhortation. This is a talk that deals with the duties of those who have ordained in the Buddha's dispensation, but these practices also apply to lay people as well. Lay people can take these practices and train themselves to be good people, so that they can be eyes and ears, legs, feet, and hands, to help look after the work of the religion and to help it prosper. These guidelines, which apply to all of us, fall under six headings. Anupakto, not disparaging. Anupakto, not injuring. Pamakhi C.A. Savaro, restraint in line with the Pamakha Matat C.A. Bates My, moderation in food. Pantanksa Sayanzana, dwelling in seclusion. Adhisit C.A. Yago, commitment to the heightened mind. Ada Buddhasana, this is the Buddha's bidding. The first guideline, Anupapto. Don't go finding fault with one another. In other words, don't say evil things about one another, don't misrepresent one another, don't say anything that will cause people to fall apart from one another. Don't start false reports about one another, and don't encourage them. Don't curse or yell at one another. Instead of finding fault with one another, each of us should look at his or her own faults. This is what's meant by Anupapto. You can use this principle anywhere, whether you're ordained or not. Anupakto, don't allow yourself to hate one another. It's only normal that when people live together, their behavior isn't going to be on an equal level. Some people have good manners, some people have coarse manners not evil, mind you, just that their manners are coarse. Physically, some people are energetic, industrious, and strong, others are weak and sickly. Verbally, some people are skilled at speaking, others are not. Some people talk a lot, some people hardly talk at all, some people like to talk about worldly things, some people like to talk about the Dhamma, some people speak wrong, some people speak right. This is called inequality. When this is the case, there are bound to be conflicts and clashes, at least to some extent. When these things arise among us while we live together within the boundaries of the same Dhamma, we shouldn't hold grudges. We should forgive one another and wash away that stain from our hearts. Why? Because otherwise it turns into animosity and enmity. The act of forgiving is called the gift of forgiveness. It turns you into the sort of person who doesn't hold onto things, doesn't carry things around, doesn't get caught up on things the sort of person who doesn't bear grudges. Even when there are missteps or mistakes from time to time, we should forgive one another. We should have a sense of love, affection, and kindness for everyone around us, as much as we can. This is called an upakta. It's a part of our training as Buddhists, both for householders and for contemplatives. Pamakhi C.A. Savaro, act in a way that keeps you near the entrance to Nibna. What's the entrance to Nibna? The Pamakha. Mukha means mouth or entrance. Mokha means liberation. Sit close to your food so that your mouth is near liberation. Don't sit far away, or you'll have trouble eating. Sit close enough so that liberation is within reach and you can stick it right in your mouth. In other words, whatever behavior is near the ways of the religion, that's the behavior you should follow. To be near the religion means following the holy life. Lay people have their holy life, too, you know, just as monks have theirs. Lay people follow the holy life in two ways. The first is observing the first five of the eight precepts, no killing, no stealing, no sex this is what makes it the holy life, no telling lies, and no intoxicants. This is one form of holy life, near the entrance to Nibna. The second way for lay people to follow the holy life is by observing all eight precepts. As for novices and monks, 
they should maintain restraint in line with the 10 or 227 precepts. At the same time, they shouldn't omit any of the good types of behavior that they should follow. This is called Krigokara Sampano. Don't go wandering around in areas that are out of bounds and can harm you. In other words, don't let your body go there, don't let your speech dwell on those places, and don't let your mind go there, either. Don't associate with immoral people who are coarse in their habits. Don't ask advice from unvirtuous people. Don't let your mind get entangled with them. Try to keep in mind people who are good, together with the goodness that you yourself are trying to develop. This is called the holy life. Whoever behaves in this way is said to be restrained in line with the Pimakha, right next to Nibna. Matatsiya Bathesmai, have a sense of moderation in the food you eat. Here I'll talk about physical food. People eat in three ways, and the first is eating greedily. Even though the stomach is full, the mind isn't full. The mouth is full, you can't swallow what you've got, the stomach is full, and yet the mind still wants to eat more. This is called eating greedily. Don't let this greed take charge of the heart. The second type is eating contentedly. You're content with what you have in your arms bowl, and don't eat anything outside your bowl. Or you're content with the food within reach. You don't ask for anything out of reach. You don't give any sign with your hand, your eyes, or your expression that you'd like more to eat. You eat only what's on your plate, what's in your bowl. This is called eating contentedly. The third type is eating modestly. This type of eating is very good, both in terms of the world and of the Dhamma. Take Venerable Svali as an example. He ate modestly. How did he eat modestly? All that most of us know about Venerable Svali is that he was wealthy in terms of the donations he received. But where did that wealth come from? It comes from eating modestly. Eating modestly is the source that gives rise to wealth. What Venerable Svali did was this, whenever he received cloth, if he didn't then give a gift of cloth, he wouldn't wear what he had received. When he received food in his bowl, he wouldn't eat until he had given some of it as a gift to someone else. No matter which of the four requisites he received food, clothing, shelter, or medicine, no matter how much or how little once it was in his possession, he wouldn't use it until he had shared some of it with those around him. When he received a lot, he would make a large gift to benefit many people. When he received just a little, he'd still try to benefit others. This gave rise to all sorts of good things. His friends loved him, his community loved him, and they were kind to him. This is why being generous is said to tie the knot of friendship and to wipe out your enemies. So that's what Venerable Svali did. When he passed away from that lifetime and was reborn in his last lifetime, he gained all kinds of wealth and never had to go hungry. Even when he went to live in places where food should have been scarce, he never suffered from scarcity, never had to do without. What this means for us is that, whatever we get, we eat only a third and give the other two thirds away. The parts appropriate for animals, we give to animals. The parts appropriate for human beings, we give to human beings. The parts we should share with our fellows in the holy life, we give with a clear heart. This is what it means to be modest in our consumption. We feel ease of heart and ease of body. When we die, we won't be poor. This principle is something very good not only in terms of the religion, but also in terms of the modern world at large. It's a great means for subduing terrorism. How does it subdue terrorism? When people aren't poor, they don't get stirred up. Where does terrorism come from? It comes from people having nowhere to live, nothing to eat, no one to look after them. When they're poor and starving like this, they think, as long as I'm suffering, let's have everyone else suffer all the same. Don't let there be any private property. Let everything be owned in common. This kind of thinking comes from poverty and deprivation. And why is there poverty? Because some people eat all alone. They don't share with people at large. Then when people at large suffer and feel revenge, they turn into communists and terrorists. 
So terrorism comes from greed and selfishness, from not sharing what we've got. If we get 10 baht, we can give away 9 and eat what we can get for the 1 baht remaining. That way we'll have lots of friends. There will be love and affection, peace and prosperity. How can that come about? When people have places to live and food to eat, when they can eat their fill and can sleep when they lie down, why would they want to bother their heads with the confusion of politics? This is why the Buddha taught us that modesty in our consumption is something good, something noble and outstanding. When we practice in this way, we're in line with the phrase, Matatsya Bhattasmai. We'll be practicing right, practicing properly, for the benefit of ourselves and others. Pantanksa Sayanzana, don't be a busybody. Wherever you live, try to be quiet and at peace. Don't get entangled or play the gongs with the other members of the group. Don't get involved in issues unless it really can't be helped. When you've studied and understand your duties, look for quiet, solitary places to live and to meditate. When you live with others, look for quiet groups to live with. When you live alone, in physical seclusion, be a quiet person. Even when you live with the group, be a secluded person. Take only the good, peaceful things the group has to offer. When you live alone, don't get involved in a lot of activity. Be quiet in your actions, quiet in your speech, quiet in your mind. When you live in a group either two or three people don't get involved in quarrels, for when there's quarreling there's no peace. Your actions aren't peaceful, for you have to get up and storm around. Your words aren't peaceful. Your mind with its thoughts of anger, revenge and ill will isn't peaceful. And this gives rise to all sorts of bad karma. When you live in a community anywhere from 4 on up to 99 you have to make sure that the community is at peace, that there's no conflict, no quarreling, no hurting one another's feelings or doing one another harm. The community should be a cooperative for training peacefully in virtue and the Dhamma. That's when it's a good community, orderly and civilized, fostering progress for all its members. This is one of our duties as part of the Buddha's following, in line with the Buddha's bidding. It's called Pantanksa Sayanzana, creating a quiet place to live, at your ease in both body and mind. Adhisitsa Yago, don't be complacent. Be diligent in practicing concentration to the level of Adhisitta, or the heightened mind. Practice concentration frequently, sit in concentration frequently as an example to the rest of the community. When you talk, seek advice in how to develop your meditation theme. Discuss the rewards of concentration. Practice ridding the heart of its hindrances. When you do this, you're acting in line with the principle of heightened mind. Another level of heightened mind is when the mind has been freed from its hindrances and has entered concentration, without any ups or downs. It's solid, stalwart, and strong, with nothing defiling it. This is called adhisitsa yago, commitment to the heightened mind. So don't be complacent. Keep working at this always. Ada Buddhasana, when you do this, you're acting in line with the Buddha's bidding. These are the Buddha's words, straight from his mouth. So we should all work at giving rise to these principles within ourselves. If you establish yourself in these teachings, in all honesty and integrity, then even if you can't liberate your mind totally from suffering, at the very least you'll be developing yourself in the right direction. Your bad habits will disappear day by day, and the good habits you've never had before will arise in their place. As for the good habits you already have, they'll prosper and flourish. So now that you've listened to this, take it and put it into practice. Train yourself to behave in line with the Buddha's exhortation. When you do that, you'll meet with happiness and prosperity as you flourish in line with his bidding. Visca PJA with Macron. May 24, 1956. PJA with Macron C. Ape Janina. Etam Magalamadama. Homage to those deserving homage. This is the highest blessing. I'm now going to give a Dhamma talk, discussing the teachings of the Buddha, as an adornment to the mindfulness and discernment of all those gathered here to listen, 
so that you will take the Dhamma and put it into practice as a way of achieving the benefits that are supposed to come from listening to the Dhamma. Today, Visca Pja with Makron, is an extremely important day in the Buddhist tradition, for it was on this day that the Buddha was born, and 35 years later awoke to the unexcelled right self-awakening, and another 45 years later passed away into total Nibbna. In each case, these events took place on the full moon day in May, when the moon is in the Visca asterism, which is why the day is called Visca Pja with Makron. Every year when this important day comes around again, we Buddhists take the opportunity to pay homage to the Buddha as a way of expressing our gratitude for his goodness. We sacrifice our daily affairs to make merit in a skillful way by doing such things as practicing generosity, observing the precepts, and listening to the Dhamma. This is called paying homage to the virtues of the Triple Gem, the Buddha, Dhamma, and Saga. The Buddha is like our father, while the Dhamma is like our mother in that it's what gives birth to our knowledge of the Buddha's teachings. At present our father has passed away, leaving only our mother still alive. Both of them have been protecting us, looking after us, so that we've been able to stay free and happy up to the present. We're thus greatly in their debt and should find a way of showing our gratitude in keeping with the fact that we are their children. Ordinarily, when people's parents die, they have to cry and lament, wear black, etc., as a way of showing their mourning. On Visca Pja with Makron which is the anniversary of the day on which our father, the Buddha, passed away we show our mourning too, but we do it in a different way. Instead of crying, we chant the passages reflecting on the virtues of the Buddha, Dhamma, and Saga. Instead of dressing up in black, we take off our pretty jewels, go without perfume and cologne, and dress very simply. As for the comfortable beds and mattresses on which we normally lie, we abstain from them. Instead of eating three or four times a day, as we normally like to do, we cut back to only two times or one. We have to give up our habitual pleasures if we're going to show our mourning for the Buddha our father in a sincere and genuine way. In addition to this, we bring flowers, candles, and incense to offer in homage to the Buddha, Dhamma, and Saga. This is called Misa Pja with Makron, or material homage. This is a form of practice on the external level a matter of our words and deeds. It comes under the headings of generosity and virtue, but doesn't count as the highest form of homage. There's still another level of homage Pipa Tpja with Makron, or homage through the practice which the Buddha said was supreme, i.e., meditation, or the development of the mind so that it can stand firmly in its own inner goodness, independent of any and all outside objects. This is the crucial point that the Buddha wanted us to focus on as much as possible, for this kind of practice was what enabled him to reach the highest attainment, becoming a rightly self-awakened Buddha, and enabled many of his noble disciples to become Arahants as well. So we should all take an interest and set our minds on following their example, as a way of following the footsteps of our father and mother. In this way we can be called their grateful, loyal heirs, because we listen respectfully to our parents' teachings and put them into practice. The verse from the Magala Sutta that I quoted at the beginning of the talk, Pja with Makron Ape Janina Etam Magalamadama, means homage to those deserving homage, this is the highest blessing. There are two kinds of homage, as we've already mentioned, material homage and homage through the practice. And along with these two kinds of homage, people aim their hopes at two kinds of happiness. Some of them practice for the sake of continuing in the cycle of death and rebirth, for the sake of worldly happiness. This kind of practice is called Vajjmankusala, or skillfulness leading into the cycle. For instance, they observe the precepts so that they'll be reborn as beautiful or handsome human beings, or as devas in the heavenly realms. They practice generosity so that they won't have to be poor, so that they can be reborn wealthy, as bankers or kings. This kind of skillfulness goes only as far as the qualifications for human or heavenly rebirths. It keeps spinning around in the world without ever getting anywhere at all. The other reason that people can have for paying homage is so that they will gain release from suffering. They don't want to keep spinning through death and rebirth in the world. This is called Vivajman Kuzala, 
skillfulness leading out of the cycle. In both kinds of practice, the aim is at happiness, but one kind of happiness is the pleasure found in the world, and the other is the happiness that lies above and beyond the world. When we pay homage to the Buddha, Dhamma, and Sagha, it's not the case that we have to take the results of our practice and try to push the triple gem any higher. Actually, what we're doing is to give rise to goodness that will benefit ourselves. So in searching for goodness for our own sakes, we have to keep yet another point in mind, as the Buddha taught us, a savan ca bluna patnika savan, which means, don't associate with fools. Associate only with wise people. Only then will we be safe and happy. Fools here means people whose minds and actions are shoddy and evil. They behave shoddily in their actions killing, stealing, having illicit sex and shoddily in their words, telling lies, creating disharmony, deceiving other people. In other words, they act as enemies to the society of good people at large. That's what we mean by fools. If you associate with people of this sort, it's as if you're letting them pull you into a cave where there's nothing but darkness. The deeper you go, the darker it gets, to the point where you can't see any light at all. There's no way out. The more you associate with fools, the stupider you get, and you find yourself slipping into ways that lead to nothing but pain and suffering. But if you associate with wise people and sages, they'll bring you back out into the light, so that you'll be able to become more intelligent. You'll have the eyes to see what's good, what's bad, what's right, what's wrong. You'll be able to help yourself gain freedom from suffering and turmoil, and will meet with nothing but happiness, progress and peace. This is why we're taught to associate only with good people and to avoid associating with bad. If we associate with bad people, we'll meet up with trouble and pain. If we associate with good people, we'll meet up with happiness. This is a way of giving a protective blessing to ourselves. This sort of protective blessing is something we can provide for ourselves at any time, at any place at all. We'll gain protection wherever, whenever, we provide it. For this reason, we should provide a protective blessing for ourselves at all times and all places for the sake of our own security and well-being. As for things deserving homage, whether they're the sorts of things that deserve material homage or homage through the practice, the act of homage provides a protective blessing in the same way. It provides happiness in the same way. The happiness that lies in the world, that depends on people and external things, has to suffer death and rebirth, but the happiness of the Dhamma is an internal happiness that depends entirely on the mind. It's a release from suffering and stress that doesn't require us to return to any more death and rebirth in the world ever again. These two forms of happiness come from material homage and homage through the practice, things that can either make us come back to be reborn or free us from having to be reborn. The difference lies in one little thing, whether we want to be reborn or not. If we create long, drawn-out causes, the results will have to be long and drawn out as well. If we create short causes, the results will have to be short, too. Long, drawn-out results are those that involve death and rebirth without end. This refers to the mind whose defilements haven't been polished away, the mind that has cravings and attachments fastened on the good and bad actions of people and things in the world. If people die when their minds are like this, they have to come back and be reborn in the world. To create short causes, though, means to cut through and destroy the process of becoming and birth so as never to give rise to the process again. This refers to the mind whose inner defilements have been polished off and washed away. This comes from examining the faults and forms of darkness that arise in our own hearts, keeping in mind the virtues of the Buddha, Dhamma, and Sagha, or any of the 40 meditation topics that are set out in the texts, to the point where we can see through all mental fabrications in line with their nature as events. In other words, we see them as arising, remaining, and then disintegrating. We keep the range of our awareness short and close to home our own body, from head to foot without latching onto any of the good or bad actions of anyone or anything in the world. We look for a solid foundation for the mind, so that it can stay fixed and secure entirely within itself, with no attachment at all, even for the body. 
when we've reached this state, then when we die we won't have to come swimming back to be reborn in the world ever again. Whether we give material homage or homage through the practice, if we pull the focal point of the mind out and place it in our actions i.e., if we get attached to our good actions, as in practicing virtue, generosity, etc. then that's called Vajman Kuzala, skillfulness leading into the cycle. The mind isn't free. It has to become the slave of this or that thing, this or that action, this or that preoccupation. This is a long, drawn-out cause that will force us to come back and be reborn. But if we take the results of our good actions in terms of virtue, generosity, etc. and bring them into the mind's inner foundation, so that they're stashed away in the mind, without letting the mind run out after external causes, this is going to help cut down on our states of becoming and birth so that eventually we don't have to come back and be reborn. This is Vivajman Kuzala, skillfulness leading out of the cycle. This is the difference between these two forms of skillfulness. The human mind is like a bale fruit. When it's fully ripe it can no longer stay on the tree. It has to fall off, hit the ground, and eventually decay into the soil. Then, when it's been exposed to the right amount of air and water, the seed gradually sprouts again into a trunk with branches, flowers, and fruit containing all its ancestry in the seeds. Eventually the fruit falls to the ground and sprouts as yet another tree. It keeps going around and around in this way, without ever getting annihilated. If we don't destroy the juices in the seeds that allow them to germinate, they'll have to keep their genetic inheritance alive for an eon. If we want to gain release from suffering and stress, we have to make our minds shoot out of the world, instead of letting them fall back into the world the way bale fruits do. When the mind shoots out of the world, it will find its landing spot in a place that won't let it come back and be reborn. It will stay there aloft in total freedom, free from attachment of any sort. Freedom here means sovereignty. The mind is sovereign within itself. In charge of itself. It doesn't have to depend on anyone, and doesn't have to fall slave to anything at all. Within ourselves we find the mind paired with the body. The body isn't all that important, because it doesn't last. When it dies, the various elements earth, water, wind, and fire fall apart and return to their original condition. The mind, though, is very important, because it lasts. It's the truly elemental thing residing in the body. It's what gives rise to states of becoming and birth. It's what experiences pleasure and pain. It doesn't disintegrate along with the body. It remains in existence, but as something amazing that can't be seen. It's like the flame of a lit candle, when the candle goes out, the fire element is still there, but it doesn't give off any light. Only when we light a new candle will the fire appear and give light again. When we take the body composed of elements, aggregates, sense media, and its 32 parts and the mind or awareness itself and simplify them to their most basic terms, we're left with name and form, nma, rupa. Form is another term for the body made up of the four elements. Name is a term for the mind residing in the body, the element that creates the body. If we want to cut back on states of becoming and birth, we should take as our frame of reference just these two things name and form as they're experienced in the present. How does form the body stay alive? It stays alive because of the breath. Thus the breath is the most important thing in life. As soon as the breath stops, the body has to die. If the breath comes in without going out, we have to die. If it goes out without coming back in, we have to die. So think about the breath in this way with every moment, at all times, regardless of whether you're sitting, standing, walking, or lying down. Don't let the body breathe without your mind getting some good use out of it. A person who doesn't know his or her own breath is said to be dead. Heedless. Lacking in mindfulness. As the Buddha said, heedlessness is the path to danger, to death. We can't let our minds run out and get stuck on external preoccupations, i.e., thoughts of past or future, whether they're good or bad. We have to keep our awareness right in the present, at the breath coming in and out. This is called singleness of preoccupation, ekajitrama. 
We can't let the mind slip off into any other thoughts or preoccupations at all. Our mindfulness has to be firmly established in our awareness of the present. The mind will then be able to develop strength, able to withstand any preoccupations that come striking against it, giving rise to feelings of good, bad, liking, and disliking the hindrances that would defile the mind. We have to keep our awareness exclusively in the present, alert, and quick to sense the arising and passing away of preoccupations, letting go of both good and bad preoccupations without getting attached to them. When the mind stays firmly focused in its one preoccupation the breath it will give rise to concentration, to the point where the eye of inner knowledge appears. For example, it might give rise to powers of clairvoyance or clairaudience, enabling us to see events past and future, near and far. Or it might give rise to knowledge of previous lives, so that we can know how we and other beings have been born, died, come, and gone, and how all these things have come about from good and bad actions. This will give rise to a sense of dismay and disenchantment with states of becoming and birth, and will dissuade us from ever wanting to create bad karma ever again. This kind of disenchantment is something useful and good, without any drawbacks. It's not the same thing as its near cousin, weariness. Weariness is what happens when a person, say, eats today to the point of getting so full that the thought of eating any more makes him weary. But tomorrow, his weariness will wear off and he'll feel like eating again. Disenchantment, though, doesn't wear off. You'll never again see any pleasure in the objects of your disenchantment. You see birth, aging, illness, and death as stress and suffering, and so you don't ever want to give rise to the conditions that will force you to come back and undergo birth aging, illness, and death ever again. The important factors for anyone practicing to gain release from all stress and suffering are persistence and endurance, for every kind of goodness has to have obstacles blocking the way, always ready to destroy it. Even when the Buddha himself was putting his effort into the practice, the armies of Mra were right on his heels, pestering him all the time, trying to keep him from attaining his goal. Still, he never wavered, never got discouraged, never abandoned his efforts. He took his perfection of truthfulness and used it to drive away the forces of Mra until they were utterly defeated. He was willing to put his life on the line in order to do battle with the forces of Mra, his heart solid, unflinching, and brave. This was why he was eventually able to attain a glorious victory, realizing the unexcelled right self-awakening, becoming our Buddha. This is an important example that he as our father set for his descendants to see and to take to heart. So when we're intent on training our minds to be good, there are bound to be obstacles the forces of Mra just as in the case of the Buddha, but we simply have to slash our way through them, using our powers of endurance and the full extent of our abilities to fight them off. It's only normal that when we have something good, there are going to be other people who want what we've got, in the same way that sweet fruit tends to have worms and insects trying to eat it. A person walking along the road empty-handed doesn't attract anyone's attention, but if we're carrying something of value, there are sure to be others who will want what we've got, and will even try to steal it from us. If we're carrying food in our hand, dogs or cats will try to snatch it. But if we don't have any food in our hand, they won't pounce on us. It's the same way when we practice. When we do good, we have to contend with obstacles if we want to succeed. We have to make our hearts hard and solid like diamond or rock, which don't burn when you try to set them on fire. Even when they get smashed, the pieces maintain their hardness as diamond and rock. The Buddha made his heart so hard and solid that when his body was cremated, parts of it didn't burn and still remain as relics for us to admire even today. This was through the power of his purity and truthfulness. So we should set our minds on purifying our bodies and minds until they become so truly elemental that fire won't burn them, just like the Buddha's relics. Even if we can't get them to be that hard, at least we should make them like tamarind seeds in their casing, even if insects bore through the casing and eat all the flesh of the tamarind fruit, they can't do anything to the seeds, which maintain their hardness as always. So, to summarize, cutting down on states of becoming and birth means retracting our awareness inward. 
we have to take the mind's foundation and plant it firmly in the body, without getting attached to any outside activity at all. We have to let go of everything of every sort that follows the laws of events, arising and passing away in line with its nature. We do good, but don't let the mind go running out after the good. We have to let the results of our goodness come running into the mind. We pull in everything of every sort to stash it away in our mind, and don't let the mind get scattered outside, getting happy or sad over the results of its actions or anything else external. We do this in the same way that the bale fruit keeps the trunk, branches, flowers and leaves of the bale tree curled up inside the seed. If we can then prevent outside conditions of soil and water from combining with the inside potential of the seed, it won't be able to unfurl into a new bale tree. Whoever practices in the way I've discussed here is paying homage to our Lord Buddha in the correct way. Such a person will be endowed with blessings providing happiness throughout time. Here I've discussed some verses from the Magala Sutta as a way of developing our discernment, so that we will take these lessons and put them into practice as a way of paying homage to the Buddha, Dhamma, and Saga on this Visca PJA with Makron Day. That's enough for now, so I'll stop here. Iva. The Power of Goodness. October 4, 1960. The goodness we've been developing here, don't forget it. It's bound to bear fruit. Don't underestimate it, thinking that the little things we've been doing here won't bear much fruit. Don't underestimate it at all. There are examples from the time of the Buddha. Some of the monks and novices, after ordaining, weren't able to cut through their defilements. They were only able to thin them out a bit, so they got discouraged and disrobed. After disrobing they had to find a livelihood, sometimes in ways that were honest, sometimes in ways that were not. Those who got involved in dishonest ways were caught by the civil authorities and imprisoned. One example was a student of Sriputta. He ordained to develop his goodness, but when he didn't get the results he had hoped for he disrobed and became a thief. After a while he was caught and sentenced to death. Before he was to be executed, the civil authorities decided to torture him for seven days as an example to the general public so as to discourage other people from breaking the law. The king ordered his officials to sharpen some wood and iron spears to a super fine point, to plant them in rows, and then to have the thief sit and lie on the spear points so that they would skewer his body, causing him to be bathed in blood and to experience excruciating pain. They would do this three times a day morning, noon, and evening calling the people of the city to come and see an example of how thieves have to suffer. The plan was to have the thief tortured like this for seven days and then to behead him, but the thief still had some good karma left over from the time he had studied with Sriputta. Sriputta had taught him to follow some of the ascetic practices and to meditate, and he had been able to develop his mind to the level of the first yuna but the first yuna wasn't enough to withstand his defilements and cravings, which is why he had disrobed. It so happened that on the sixth day, Sriputta, through his great compassion after all, there were times when he, in the Buddha's stead, had helped teach the populace to practice the Dhamma used the powers of his meditation to check up on his students who were still ordained, as well as those who had disrobed to return to the lay life, to see where they were and how they were doing. Because of the goodness that the thief had developed with Sriputta, a light appeared to Sriputta in which he saw that his student was being tortured and was scheduled to be beheaded the next day. On seeing this, Sriputta contemplated the student's reserves of goodness, seeing that he still had some potential, but that it had all withered away. Even so, some of the goodness he had developed was still buried there inside him. Even though defilements had enwrapped his heart, there was still some goodness there. On realizing this, Sriputta went on his alms round in the early morning to the area where his student was being tortured. His student was lying on his bed of spears as Sriputta came near. The place was thronged with people running around in excitement, some of them excited about seeing Sriputta, some of them excited about seeing the thief being tortured. It so happened that the crowd parted briefly, enough for Sriputta's student to see the edge of his teacher's robe. Sriputta spread thoughts of goodwill, which the student could feel and which served as a guarantee of his presence, but that was as close as he could get. On seeing Sriputta the student felt overjoyed, thinking, 
Tomorrow I'm going to have to take my leave of my teacher I'm going to be executed. At the thought of bowing down to his teacher, he remembered Sraputa's meditation instructions, and so he started to practice Yuna, stilling his mind in concentration. When his mind grew still, he reflected on death, thinking, tomorrow they're going to get me for sure. There's no doubt about that. So he reflected further, where is death? Where does death happen? And he came to the realization that death lies at the end of your nose, if the breath stops, that's it. But as long as you're still breathing, then even if you're being brutally tortured, you're not dead. So he started to practice mindfulness of breathing. As soon as he got focused on the breath, the breath grew absolutely still and his blood stopped flowing from his wounds. When the blood stopped flowing, his wounds closed up and healed. When his wounds were healed, he felt a sense of rapture and joy over how much his meditation had been able to overcome the pain. So he surveyed the parts of his body hair of the head, hair of the body, nails, teeth, skin back and forth, over and over again, until all the severed parts of his body connected back up again. When the parts of his body gained strength like this, he was able to sit up in full lotus on the tips of the spears and to enter into yuna, the first yuna, the second, the third, and the fourth. On entering into the fourth yuna, his body became as light as a tuft of cotton and stronger than the wood and iron spears. The tips of the spears couldn't penetrate his body anymore. Finally, his mind entered fixed penetration and he made a vow, if I escape with my life, I'm going back to live with my teacher. He focused his mind in the fourth yuna, with its two factors. The first was singleness of preoccupation, not involved with anything at all, the thought that they were going to execute him had disappeared completely. The second factor was mindfulness, bright and dazzling. And in that light of mindfulness he was able to see his teacher. So he made another determination, I'm going to go stay with my teacher. As soon as he made this determination, his body levitated up into the air and went to where Sraputa was. After rejoining his teacher, he vowed he would never do anything evil ever again. So he practiced meditation and came out of the whole affair alive. He didn't become an arahant or anything, but he did come out alive. This goes to show that even though the goodness we develop doesn't meet with our expectations right away, we shouldn't underestimate it. Goodness is like fire. You shouldn't underestimate fire, for a single match can destroy an entire city. Goodness has power in just the same way. This is why the Buddha taught us not to underestimate the goodness we develop. Even though it seems to be just a tiny bit, it has the power to ward off unfortunate events, to turn heavy into light, and to keep us safe and secure. This is one point to remember. Another point is that people are like plants. Say that you plant some squash seeds in the ground, you want the seeds to grow and give you squash right away, but they can't do that. Still, the nature of what you've planted will grow bit by bit, and after a while will give you the squash you want. But if you sit there and watch it to see how much the squash plant grows in a day, an hour, a minute, to see how many centimeters the shoot will grow, can you measure it? No, of course not. But do you believe that it's growing every day? Sure. If it weren't growing, how would it get so long over time? The same holds true with however much or little goodness we develop, even though we don't see the results right away, they're sure to come. You can know how much good you've done in a day, but you can't know how much goodness has resulted from your actions. Still, if you ask whether there are results, you have to answer yes. It's like the squash plant, you can't see it growing, but you know that it grows. Even though the goodness you've been doing doesn't seem to be developing, you shouldn't underestimate it. Another point is that some people are like banana trees. The nature of banana trees is that if you cut them off at the trunk and then come back in an hour, you'll see that a new shoot has grown a whole inch from the top. In two or three days, the shoot will have grown a foot or two. Some people are like this. They get fast results, extraordinary results, and develop all kinds of abilities. For example, 
they can get quickly into you and then clearly explain what they've experienced to other people. The same thing happened in the time of the Buddha. Take Kapanthaka, for example, he had worked at developing goodness for a long time, but when he finally got the hang of the meditation, practicing with a sense of wounded pride after being scorned by his friends, he got results right away. The story is this, once, when he was staying with a group of 500 monks headed by the Buddha, a moneylender invited the whole group for a meal at his home. Kapanthaka's older brother, Ma Panthaka, was the meal distributor. Whoever came with an invitation, it was Ma Panthaka's duty to inform the other monks. Now, Ma Panthaka was ashamed of his younger brother for being so lazy and torpid in his meditation, nodding off all the time. So, thinking that Kapanthaka didn't deserve to eat food in anyone's home, Ma Panthaka decided not to include him in the invitation. He invited only the remaining 499 monks, headed by the Buddha, to go to the moneylender's meal. When the group arrived at the moneylender's home and all the monks were served, one tray of food was left over. So the moneylender asked Ma Panthaka why the monks didn't number the full 500 he had asked for, Ma Panthaka informed him that Kapanthaka hadn't been included in the invitation. The moneylender then went to the Buddha. The Buddha, knowing that Kapanthaka was meditating back at the monastery, told the moneylender that Kapanthaka was an important monk, the moneylender would have to send one of his servants to invite him to the meal. But because the Buddha wanted the moneylender to see the powers Kapanthaka had developed, he didn't explain how to go about making the invitation. He let the moneylender's servant go to see for himself, only then would he explain. As for Kapanthaka, his pride had been so wounded that he decided to go without food and to sit in meditation that day. It so happened that he entered the fourth yuna, never since the day of his birth had his meditation progressed so far. On reaching the fourth yuna, he entered the fifth, making his mind clear, bright, and blooming, and giving rise to supernormal strengths both in body and mind. It was at that point that the moneylender's servant arrived at the monastery. Kapanthaka saw him and made a mental determination, causing monks all of them images of himself to fill the monastery. Some were sitting in meditation, some were doing walking meditation, some were washing their robes. The servant went to ask one of the monks where Kapanthaka was, and the monk pointed to another part of the monastery. He went to that part of the monastery and asked one of the monks there, who pointed to still another part of the monastery. This kept up until the time for the meal was almost over, and yet the servant couldn't locate Kapanthaka at all. So he ran back to the moneylender's house. The Buddha at this point knew that Kapanthaka had perfected his psychic powers and from now on wouldn't be scorned by his friends, so he told the servant to go back and make the invitation again, but this time he told him how to do it. How was that? When the servant asked one of the monks where Kapanthaka was, then as soon as the monk was about to open his mouth, the servant should grab him by the arm before he had a chance to speak. So the servant did as he was told. He went back to the monastery, which was still filled with monks, and asked one of the monks where Kapanthaka was. As the monk started to point to another part of the monastery, the servant grabbed hold of his arm. The instant he grabbed the monk by the arm, all the other monks in the monastery disappeared, leaving only the monk he was holding. So he invited that monk to the meal at the moneylender's home. From that point on Kapanthaka became one of the prominent monks of the saga, with all sorts of extraordinary psychic abilities. He was able to stand in the sun without getting hot, to walk in the rain without getting wet, to travel great distances in no time at all. He could make himself appear in many places at once, in forests, cemeteries, and other places as well. He developed all kinds of powers. As a result, he was able to get over his wounded pride from being scorned by his friends, and instead became one of the more extraordinary of the Buddha's prominent disciples. This is the power of goodness. Some people gain extraordinary powers and wide-ranging abilities, mature in their concentration, mature in their insight, able to reach Nibbna in this very life. All of this comes from the goodness, the perfections they've developed. 
so we should take pride in the goodness we've been developing, too. There's another story, about an old woman who went to a monastery one day and saw that the walking meditation paths were dirty. She swept the paths clear of the dirt and rubbish, so that the monks could walk conveniently on the paths. She did it only this once, but she did it with an attitude of love, an attitude of conviction, an attitude of respect, and a pure state of mind. The dirt and rubbish had made her feel dispirited, so she swept it all away and set out water for washing the feet, as a result, her mind felt clean and refreshed. Soon after she returned home she had a heart attack. After she died she was reborn as a deva with a large following, a palace, divine food, and all kinds of abundant wealth. Living in her palace, she began to remember her previous life and thought to herself, if I had done lots of merit, I'd be even richer than I am now. It'd be good to go back and do good things for just a little bit longer, so that I could get even more abundant results than what I have now. Before, I had no idea that goodness would give results like this. So she left heaven and came down to earth, prowling around in search of monks in the forest and wilderness. She came across one monk who was about to enter concentration, so she stood there staring at him, looking for a way to be of service. But when he saw her, he chased her away, what kind of deva is this, trying to horn in on human beings merit? Before, you underestimated merit, but now that you've received good results you want even more. How greedy can you get? Go away. I won't let you do anything. Let human beings have a chance to do good. There are lots of people who don't have any of the good things you do. Don't come horning in on their chance for goodness. She grinned, the deva fled back up to heaven and had to content herself with the results she already had. She had wanted to make more merit, but they wouldn't let her. Why was that? We human beings tend to underestimate little acts of merit, but after you die it's hard for you to make any more merit at all. How is it hard? Your body is no longer like a human body. You can't talk with human beings at all. You can't even put food in monks' bowls. The best you can do is simply stand around rejoicing in the merit of others. Only human beings with good eyes can see you. Those without that kind of eye won't detect you at all. If you encounter those with the right mental powers, they can teach you to some extent. But if you don't encounter that kind of person when you're a deva, you have no way of developing any more goodness. So you shouldn't underestimate the power of goodness. As long as you've got the time and the opportunity, then whenever you notice the chance to do goodness of which you're capable, you should hurry up and make the effort, trying to develop that goodness as soon as you can. If death were to come right now, what would you have left? Nothing. All you could do is wrap up the trail mix you've put aside in other words, the goodness you've done in the past. When you remember it, that goodness will nourish your spirit, helping you reach one of the good destinations in the heavenly worlds. If you've developed your mind in strong concentration, you'll be able to gain release from the range of worldliness and take your heart to the transcendent. So those of us who haven't yet developed the goodness we've hoped for, don't underestimate what you've got. Regard what you've done as your wealth. This wealth of yours is what will prevent your life from falling into low places. As long as you stay in this world, you can depend on the good you've done to determine the course of your life. If you leave this world, your goodness will follow you like a shadow at all times. Here I've been talking about the goodness we've joined our hearts together in developing here. Take the advice I've given and remember it as part of your recollection of the Dhamma.